Welcome back to the Deadology Podcast from Pencil Hill Studio, New Paltz, New York. I'm your host, Howard Weiner. This is Season 2, Episode 13 of the podcast. Today is March 25th, 2024, and therefore, let's time travel back 39 years to Springfield, Massachusetts, the Civic Center. And about this time on that night, I was jumping for joy because I just saw one of the great shows of 1985. Uh, awesome night in Springfield. It was the second of two nights there. And we're going to dig into that show. Uh, but let me give you the road uh, prior to Springfield. And also I want to share one life-changing, one Grateful Dead life-changing event with you, uh, which happened prior to that tour. Um, you know, I'm 21 years old, I'm smoking about a pack and a half, maybe two packs of cigarettes a day. I was a decent athlete, but I'd, I'd be smoking between basketball games, that kind of thing, just way too much smoking. So my parents did a beautiful thing. They said, hey, we want you to quit smoking. If you quit, we'll buy you a new stereo. Very generous, beautiful idea, but I already had a great stereo, so it wasn't much uh, leverage for me uh, to do that or motivation. Uh, so I came back with a counter offer. I said, How about you buy me tickets for the upcoming Grateful Dead Spring Tour and I'll quit smoking? And this was a, a better deal for my parents, obviously, because the back then tickets weren't that much and they even threw in a couple hotel rooms. And that very second where I agreed to do it, I just quit smoking cold turkey. There was nothing to it. Um, I haven't smoked a cigarette since. And uh, these days, my 60-year-old lungs are very thankful to my parents, and especially the Grateful Dead. Just the motivation of getting the tickets for the tour was all it took for me to quit smoking. And um, yeah, luckily, my parents, this was 1985. You know, if they had to do this in 2024, they would have to take out a home equity loan or something with, with the price of tickets these days. Uh, but yeah, so it was a very cool thing. I'll, I'll always remember... A lot of great things about that tour, but especially just the the ease with which I quit smoking with the Grateful Dead as the motivation for it. And um, talking about smoking and someone who should have quit, uh, Jerry Garcia, early in the year of 1985, I think it was June, January 18th, uh, that year I got busted in the Golden Gate uh, Park, uh, Bindles of Heroin, and, um, you know, it was, it was big news. And every time he sang Bertha, like he did in the first night in Springfield, there was the big cheer, throw me in the jailhouse. Uh, but it was an unfortunate times. Uh, Jerry was working through some, you know, obviously through difficult times, which came to a head with his coma in 1986. Uh, but yeah, somehow in that, in 1985, there were various, great moments and some not so great moments uh but the grateful dead just plowed ahead and you know and, and did their thing in spite of all all the uh troubles uh jerry was facing at the time uh so the spring tour started uh march 21st and 22nd in hampton virginia um went down there with my friend doug who has been on the podcast a couple other people and uh, we went down to the shows Two shows, the band was flat, uh, the song choices weren't uninspired. Uh, it, it was We came home from those Hampton shows after driving down there. We, I mean, we have a great time driving down, listening to the tapes, partying before the shows. Um, but, you know, we're, we're paying money, we're putting a lot of effort into it. The Dead just didn't have it in Hampton. And we're, we're young, we enjoy our lives back home. You know, we're having a good time, chasing girls, going out to bars, you know, just being 21 and living in a beautiful suburb in uh, in New York. And we were like, what the hell are we doing with our lives, you know, going to Hampton? And of course, we knew the Grateful Dead would come back later in the tour and, and make it all worthwhile. But it was really that ride home, I'll never forget, it was probably the mo one of the most disappointed, like everybody in the car, besides me and Doug, we were all just in agreement. They were terrible shows. And, um, you know, it was quite an effort to go down to Hampton and go through all that to have an unprofessional performance. 
But of course, the Grateful Dead, as always, they turn, turn the narrative around pretty quickly. Springfield, Massachusetts was the first show on the March 24th. The Dead would play Springfield 10 times in, in their career. 72 is the first show. And I'm going off the top of my head here. They played 73 once, 74. They played there in 77. They played there in 78. That's the famous uh, mescaline show um, or mushrooms that the band was all high. And uh, Dick's Picks 25 with their singing and howling, that show. Uh, they played 79. There's a great I Need a Miracle Shakedown. Um, I might be missing a show or two, but the last two shows they played were this, these, the March 24th and 25th here in 1985. So the first night in Springfield, they open up with the Bertha, the crowd's going nuts, Garcia's, you know, hitting a nice jam, good set, they ended the set with Deal, second set, Samson Cumberland, so, so there was a lot of cool things that show, it was a good Grateful Dead show, but that's what you expect, they are the best band in the land, so you expect a good show, and they gave a good show, so it's, it was kind of an average show, but just the, the relief of seeing them finally on the money. And, and this really wasn't unusual to start off, start off an East Coast tour. Um, the last tour, they played two shows down south that weren't that great in October. And then they came to Worcester and blew the roof off the place. So it's almost like a replay of the, the tour before. Uh, so now they're in Springfield, night two. And everything is just lined up because they really haven't broke out a lot of their great songs. I mean, we knew... We were due for a Jack Straw. We were due for help on the way. We were due for this and that. So we were expecting a hot show. And boy, they they had everything ready to go. And when the lights went down and the dead came out on stage that night, it was ridiculous energy. The crowd was going nuts. And you could just tell the band was psyched. Everything was, was in the, just the right state of mind. The crowd and the band and... Just the day, March 25th, 1985, you could just tell it was going to explode from the beginning. And the best one-two punch I ever saw to open a show opens this this night in Springfield, Jack Straw, Sugary. Obviously, two of my favorite songs at the time, two of my favorite songs today. And these, this is the best pairing of Jack Straw, Sugary of all time. So right away, the they come out, you know, they're doing Jack Straw. And Garcia gets to that first solo, and it's it's just glorious the way he's ripping it, and it's twice as long as usual, which I hadn't heard. Usually that first solo is very fixed in time, but right away they extend the solo, and just like right away you know it's going to be a blessed night from right from that first solo. Uh, so they get to the uh, the, the straw jam, and man, everything is just completely in line and exploding uh it's an awesome straw this is probably a, a top 10 straw and it's not just that garcia is playing so great which obviously he is it's everybody you can just hear everybody's contributions in the band especially weir is especially great on this is just his uh rhythm playing he's smashing the whammy bar making the right sounds at the right times everything was just set up perfectly on this night and let's take a listen to that Opening Jack Straw Jam.
We can share the women, we can share the wine. Smoking Jack Straw opener for Springfield. And uh, yeah, that was uh, Springfield Civic Center. Hard to think back and remember what it was like in 85. But I recently saw Santana in the, uh, it's now called the Mass Mutual Arena or something like that. Uh, incredible how they change the names of these places. You kind of lose the history, the historical, his, historical continuity um, when you change the name of a place. But um, yeah, so same arena, but yeah, I saw Carlos there. Maybe it was over the summer, six months ago. Incredible concert from Carlos Santana. So it's a small to medium-sized arena, very good acoustics, uh, just a great place to see the Grateful Dead. That's why I think after 1985, they were just too big. The uh, The idea of playing in a place like Springfield was out of the question once they came out within the dark, and they uh, rocketed to commercial success in 1987. Uh, but, uh, hey, we were blessed. This is the last show in the Springfield Civic Center, and they march on with Sugary in the two spot. And, uh, you know, it gets rolling. You know, Sugary... It's an intense song when they hit the jam, but it's pretty laid back going to, to the point where they hit the instrumental. But on this night, you could just sense the band is marching forward. There's like such energy going on. Uh, so they, you know, the Sugar Reed, Jerry's singing good. It's rolling along at a, at a nice pace. Good good opening instrumental. Uh, good, good second instrumental. Not overly long but you could just tell there's like this intensity to it uh the, the second solo it's um it's just like not as maybe not as long as some of the best ones but at the very end there's just like this burning energy like you know garcia's tell telltale signs of what's going to happen in the next jam type thing it's like they know where they're going they're gonna uh rock this sugary like you, you never heard before but um, they're, you know, they're, they're not taking their time getting there. They're kind of moving forward um, aggressively. And that's almost like a trademark of 1985 as compared to 84 and 83. Uh, there was definitely like a quicker, moving quicker from uh, jam to jam in, in, in 85. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes you'd want to hear the a little more spaced out like the years before. Uh, but the Grateful Dead, their sound was always evolving. So we get that steaming end to the second solo, uh, tell, telltale signs of the impending mayhem. In, in this third, so this third solo, basically Jerry Garcia reworks Einstein's theory of relativity. I mean, it's that crazy what he does here. So it's, it's mostly a jam that speed, execution, precision, mathematics, just incredible virtuosity. Not really the creative where he's switching ideas and taking different turns this is just a powerhouse uh jam which defies you know the the logics of math it, it's it's insane how you know it's it's mathematical but it's no, no one's ever played anything like this before just the speed he attacks the solo with so it opens up you know nicely it's going pretty good and but it's kind of funny this garcia when he's jamming has a nice little sense of humor he slows it up a little, kind of changes direction, almost like an actor walking off stage, like almost kidding, like, you know, that's it. And just when you might buy into the fact that the jam's coming to an end, he just turns on a dime and starts doing these speed licks over and over. And he just ripping into kind of the same repetition, uh, but just attacking in different ways. He's like a hungry lion clamped on a slab of beef here. Just he's got the, this sugary lick. He's playing it over and over and just taking it for all that it's worth. And it's, it's really it's just it's repetition, but just un unbelievable the, the different variations and just slightly changing it up a little bit. And just the crowd is just roaring and totally engaged with it. Um, so it's, it's incredible guitar playing. But in a way, it's not the like Garcia it can be much more creative. This is just an exercise and, you know, taking that one lick and uh, doing more than you could ever imagine with it. Uh, so, right, and that, it's definitely one of my favorite sugary jams. I wouldn't call this sugary the best one ever, but it's probably top five, top seven. So uh, let's give that 
third instrumental from the sugary a listen amazing that night in Springfield and it continues to just stay with me that Jack Straw sugary incredible um, you know I if I need something to get me fired up I'm at the gym I put in that straw sugary and it works better than any drug it's just it's amazing how that for for me personally how those two songs transcend time I've heard that straw sugary maybe a thousand times it's got to be a thousand times and I've heard a lot of the rest of the first set of this. Haven't heard the second set as much, but definitely a go-to straw sugary. And as I was listening to to the, these shows in their entirety, um, in preparation for for this podcast, um, I heard the soundboard. The soundboard's incredible. I so I heard the soundboard a bunch of times, and then I just heard the audience. And to hear the crowd reactions during this is it's unbelievable. The the crowds in 1985 were just on the money like they identified a great jam and they went nuts cheering for the dead when they when they earned it 
I think as the Grateful Dead went on, when they became so popular, they would just play a song that people loved and people would go nuts. And the band didn't have to earn the cheers. They got them automatically. In 85, it was kind of like a wise crowd out there. When Garcia was having a night like this, they just exploded. Um, you know, so it was uh, very cool listening to the audience tape. But the soundboard of this is so, so good. Um, you know, probably worth listening to both. But the soundboard's um, just like it so alive with uh, and you want to hear what's going on but yeah definitely a great audience tape to listen to because the, the crowd was hip and uh totally into it on this night and uh since i was talking about you know just a, the repetition jam there and the sugary and i i just recently listened to uh john mayer he was on a podcast i think it's the comes a time podcast and he was talking about garcia how these ideas just pop into his head these different influences, like he'll pull Freddie King and then he'll pull this guy and that guy. That's what John Mayer said. And I mentioned how I felt Garcia was uh, influenced by uh, Freddie King a couple episodes ago when I mentioned when I had Freddie King as album in the week. And he, you could hear these different ideas, how, how Garcia could just pull from all these different influences and just make it his own. You know, I think Dylan said something. He's not a member of any school, um, but he's... He includes all of them in his playing, so something along those lines. And, and Dylan re referred to him kind of like as a Charlie Christian type player. And with, with the repetition that I hear in that sugary and the, the brilliance of how he does it, it reminds me of uh, Grant Green, a, a jazz great who I think is very underestimated. That's why I'm giving him a, a little plug here. Uh, Grant Green would just lock into a, a certain riff or find something he likes he just had this ability to play it over and over again. And as he's doing that, as a as a listener, you're loving it. And you're loving the fact that, he, you know, it's like you're listening to him do it. He's loving it. He's like, listen to how good this is. I'm going to play it again for you. I'm going to play it again. I'm going to play it again. And that's incredible talent when you could repeat something and do it in a way where you draw the audience in more instead of making it seem simple. And that's the that's the talent uh, Garcia obviously had. He did, they, he's the, the master of like doing that slightly varied repetition lick. And just to if you don't know a lot of Grant Green, I'm gonna just point out two albums which um, I'd highly recommend. You got Green is Beautiful. I think that came out around 1970. Could be 69. Um, you know, around around the time. Probably right after Miles Davis changed the world of jazz with uh, Bitches Brew in a silent way and then B Bitches Brew. Uh, so it's not a true fusion album, but it's kind of like a funk rock, uh, classic jazz mix, uh, amazing versions of A Day in the Life, the Beatles song, uh, James Brown, Ain't It Funky, um, the classic love ballad, I'll Never Fall in Love Again, just a brilliant playing from Grant Green and if, and if you listen to it right away you'll be able to say oh yeah there, there's a little Garcia in there all his albums I hear that and for a more classic traditional jazz album early in his career I'd recommend Green Street you know just uh, some great playing sounds a, a lot like Wes Montgomery um, very clean um, lots of you know just lots of crazy jamming and uh, but the thing that really stands out when I when I listen to Grant Green, I, I hear that Garcia repetition in there, which obviously Grant Green did it first. I don't know if Gar Garcia. I think somebody once told me that Garcia had listened to Grant Green and, and had cited him um, with some things. Um, maybe they just attack guitar playing the same way. Um, but yeah, Grant Green, gotta check him out if you haven't listened to a lot of Grant Green. Next up. Now we're going back to Springfield, March 25th, 85, Little Red Rooster. And this is a damn good version. Um, by this time, you know, the, the rooster kind of lost its luster. Um, you know, they, the versions that came out with in 81 and 82, Garcia was all over it. He was loving playing that jam. And then it just kind of settled in. It wasn't as exciting to them anymore. On this night, once again, Garcia's totally in the moment with the rooster. It's a great ending solo. I, I think Weir's slide guitar playing is excellent on this. You know, I, th I think he, t he takes way too much criticism. Um, while he may not have been a great slide guitar, and he's kind of working up his talents here, it was the perfect, when he did like a slide solo before Garcia, it was the perfect setup. 
I don't care that he's not the greatest slide guitarist in the world, but it just worked within the framework of the music. Like he would do his slide lead and he'd set the stage for Garcia. It was perfect. So, um, but yeah, great rooster here. The energy is still obviously pouring through as it does for the rest of his first, first set. Uh, the fourth song, Bird Song. And Jerry's voice is nice here. And just a little discourse on Jerry's voice in 85. Most shows, Jerry had a lot of trouble. 85 was not a good year for his singing. Um, just as his, his throat was gone, all kinds of uh, issues. He definitely had better years before and after. I think his last really clean year where he was the greatest singer in the world, in my opinion, was 1982. I just, some of those 1982 versions, I mean, I hear Garcia sing. I'm like, that guy is my favorite singer of all time. He's definitely underrated as a singer. Um, but here on this night in uh, Springfield for 1985, he's singing very strong for this particular year. Uh, cool bird song, kind of switch up the momentum just a little bit, but the the pouring instrumentals come through in the, the, the jam. There's an early surge in bird song, and then they break it down, kind of rearrange it again, and come up to a nice second peak, fly around a little bit, come back to a nice second peak, and um, great song selection. And that, that's the one thing about this show, every so the song selections all the way through. Like if they would have presented um, this set list to me before the show and they said, sir, it's your night. Would you like to change anything? I would just check everything. Okay, good, good, good. There's no weak songs in the first or second set. And they lined everything up kind of perfectly. That's one of the, the magic of this show. Uh, so very good bird song. Fifth song, it's all over now. Somehow it's all over now always shows up in a good show. You know, when, when the Grateful Dead are on. And uh, this version's... Uh, another kind of version that stands out in the fact that it's just different. Not as long as some other, sometimes they could drag out, it's all over now a little bit. This one just, they, they go into it with like an urgency and it's a little funkier than some other versions. It almost sounds like Women Are Smarter or Samson when they first go into it. They're just, they got a head of steam going into it like you usually don't hear on It's All Over Now. And the for me, the instrumentals didn't stand out as much as just the overall feel and the the push of the song so uh good it's all over now in the fifth spot and then we get the first ballad of the opening set they would only do one jerry would only do one ballad in set one and and one in set two otherwise everything is just very hard hitting in in this show so it's uh it must have been the roses and jerry's voice has to be on for this song this is one where everything hinges on how he sings, and he did a, did a great vocal job here on It Must Have Been the Roses, and re really at the spot after so much uh, rocking music up to this point. And the set closes out with the most reliable set closer the Grateful Dead ever had, especially during these years, Let It Grow. And uh, yeah, hey, this th there's no such thing as between 1973 through 1986, there's no such thing as an art version of Let It Grow. They delivered this song every single time. And there's other great enders like Music Never Stopped and Deal, but sometimes they're off a little bit. As much as I love those songs, really any song, this is just something about Let It Grow. Garcia was always on this, never shortchanged the song during those years. And this is uh, an excellent version. Now, once again, with the 85, they're, they're pushing, you know, like they go through the... Uh, the, the big jam and let it grow. I'd say there's three phases in there where we're kind of signals for a change in the shift of the song. They push through the progression a little quicker than usual here, but Garcia, once again, not letting go, he just rips into this at the end. So there's a, an intense like two, three minute jam here I'm going to play for you. And this is uh, before they come back for the final reprise of Let It Grow. Just a, an awesome, awesome ending to the main jam on this uh, version.
the Grateful Dead giving it their all in that first set, man. Wow. Uh, just so intense. Great playing. Um, v- very unique, unusual set there. Just the energy level all the way through. So set two, they come out and, and their intent is the same. They're, they're in the mood this night. They want to rock the house and they're going to play their best songs and put everything into it. Uh, set two, performance-wise, doesn't compare to set one. Set one is just a 9.5 out of 10 as far as performance. Uh, set two, they try, but there's no really extraordinary highlights. But when you're at the show, is it, you know we're out there, no one's thinking that way. It's just great song after great song. So uh, let's dig into the set two here. We open up with the always... Beloved, welcomed, help on the way, Slipknot Franklins. And we, we get to the Slipknot and Jerry's, you know, noodling along. Sounds like it's going to be a great Slipknot, and, and it is. It's not as long as some of the ones from late 83, 84, but, you know, Jerry's definitely hitting all the notes. This is probably what, this might be the highlight of this, of this second set. But then one really weird thing happens. I'm in my car listening to this, and... I hear a beeping noise, and I'm looking at my seatbelt. My, my seatbelt's fastened. Um, I'm, <laughs> I hear this beeping noise. I'm like, what is there, low tire pressure? Is my engine overheating? Um, I don't think anything's going wrong with the car, but I'm like, what the hell is that beeping? You know, There's no smoke alarm in my car. And then, then it occurs to me about a minute in that it's the actual music. It's probably Brent playing some kind of synthesized sound. And this is not at all getting down on Brent, because I love Brent. I think he's a great musician, was a great musician, uh, the best backing vocalist the, the Grateful Dead ever ever had. He was just such a, a great, he, he was great, a great force in the band. He was, he was so right for the time and what they were trying to do. But whatever the hell is going on here, it doesn't work. It's just because it distracts from that. Like very, it's unusual when you hear something, someone play something that just distracts. And I've heard this tape uh, four or five times over over the weekend, and I, I get to that Slipknot, and I'm like, "What the hell is going on here?" It's just it, it's like distracting. I'm like, somebody shut the alarm off. Well, you know, it, it's like, it's like that odd. It's you know, really you know, maybe that's why I don't listen to this second set from Springfield a lot. But it's it really kind of takes away from how good. Uh, the Slipknot is. So they don't do any, you know, they stay away from that noise. Now, I don't want to blame Brent if it's not Brent. I have no idea what the hell that noise is, but it sounds like it, it was a synthesized uh, coming from, the, from uh, you know, the organ. But, um, you know, so they, they, they did, Slipknot's really good. Franklin's is pretty good. Uh, once again, this isn't like a standout version, but you got a couple of good jams, as you will, in any, any Franklin's. And, you know, the band's just giving you all the songs you want. Help Slip Franks, what might you want next? Estimated Eyes? Okay, here you go, Springfield. We're going to give you Estimated Eyes, exactly what we're craving. And in the crowd, I'm, you're just loving it. Because in the crowd, you're not hearing a soundboard. So you're not, these little imperfections like the, the keyboard, the, the synthesized sound, you're not hearing. But during this Estimated, once again, that, that sound comes in. It's almost identical to what happens at Slipknot. It doesn't even sound like playing. It's just you know, there's, there's like kind of like beeping going off, and I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play a little bit of it so you can, you can understand what I'm talking about. But totally distracting during the the, the estimated profit, even though you know Garcia's jamming pretty good, and it seems like everything's just lock and step here. But um, hey, why not? I'll just uh, play play the the estimated here. And the way I, w- I would describe this, this is when you get to the part where Bob does his uh, ha screams. And I, I I never had any problem with that. You know, I kind of liked his, uh, his his theatrics, especially more in the, back in the day. But um, when we get to this part, you know, you got that little synthesized sound coming in again. And what it makes it sound like, it makes it sound like you're you're in a nuclear reactor. The radiation alarm is going off, and there's a man screaming in terror. <laughs> it's pretty much that's the only way I could describe what this sounds like. Check it out. Bye. 
Thankfully, somebody turned off the alarm. That's the end of that synth- synthesized sound for the uh, uh, for the night. And uh, I estimated moves into Eyes of the World. You know, an average version. Um, definitely didn't catch any kind of fire in the second set here. Um, if you a uh, great eyes from this tour, the last show, April eighth in Philly Spectrum. Uh, Jerry could barely sing, but boy, does he make up with for it with the jamming and the the band is just playing it at a ridiculous pace. But still, it's incredible. Uh, that's one of the great shows of the, this particular tour, Philly Spectrum, April eighth, as well as Providence, April fourth. Um, yeah, I lo- the Providence first set, as improbable as it may seem, is even better than this one from Springfield. With the, and you could tell how much I love this one from Springfield. I'll probably get to that Providence show at a later uh, episode of the podcast, but that, that's one worth, you know, I'm sure a lot of you, got, a lot of you know uh, the April 4th show, but if you don't, April 4th, Providence 85, that first set, ridiculous. So um, <clears throat> moving on with uh, the Springfield here, drum space, and, and once again, going down the home stretch, it's all desirable stuff, songs that you want to hear. So there's like no waste at this show, no me and my uncles or no brother Esau. Hey, there's one, no other, no in the dark songs at all during the show. No throwing stones, no touch. Very unusual for 85 where all the songs are coming into prominence. No throwing stones, no touch of gray. Um, the encore is day job, but day job didn't make the album. So officially that's not, not in, in the dark song either. So very, like, I'm sure if you go through shows, it'd be tough to find a show where you don't have at least an in the dark song in there. So, but, but all very, you know, it's a very powerful song, uh, song night. Um, I like the space, the space here, pretty cool, you know, coming out of drums, um, definitely a funky, a little different feel to it. And then they break into I Need a Miracle. Uh, obviously, it's good tune, but not much of an ending jam anymore in the I Need a Miracles. But it goes into China Doll. And man, th- this one hits the spot. This is the ballad of the second set. Once again, a very rocking night where they're really uh, hitting you with, with, with all the big songs. Um, only two ballads. The Must Have Been the Roses in the first set, China Doll here. And, you know, Jerry, Jerry's voice is on again. And great guitar solo in the middle. A lot of feeling. Yeah, it's a very cool China doll. And then they jump right back into that hopped up pace with going down the road, feeling bad. Most of the versions from this time uh, moving forward, they're quick paced. Not as long as, as they had played them. But this one has a little extra zest. I mean, the Springfield show is just excellent. So pretty cool going down the road, feeling bad. And then final song of the night, Good Lovin'. Yeah, no, another desirable song, great for the crowd. Um, you know, no one, once again, Miracle, China Doll, going down the road, Good Lovin'. Can't complain with that at all. Uh, great ending to the show. And then the Day Job Encore. And of course, Day Job upset people at the time. The band eventually stopped playing it. And it kind of kind of a funnier episode to me. Um, I always kind of liked Day Job, but I never liked where they positioned it as an encore. I felt it would have worked better in the middle of a set of the first set or something like that. It's just another song instead of being a focus at the end of a set or something like that or, or an encore. Uh, but they wrap up with day job, but man, we were going nuts in the streets of Springfield. We were just, you know, if there was like a, a place for me to stand and scream Garcia is God. I'm sure I was doing it that night, man. Everybody, uh, the scene after the show, we were just all so happy after you know seeing a, seeing those two good sh- seeing the good show the night before, and this one was they gave you everything you you could possibly ask for. Um, first set on on playback, first set lives up to it, and then some. Second set not as much, but still, March twenty fifth, nineteen eighty five, Springfield, a great show, and that was the last show ever. By the Grateful Dead in the Springfield Civic Center. All right, so um, next week's podcast will be coming from Beale Street. I got a little vacation coming up. Uh, headed to Nashville to tomorrow. Probably going to see Bob Dylan down there. I know I'm going to see Bob Dylan in Memphis. 
going to do the whole music history, go to all the museums, all the magical places down there. Man, it's going to be it was a dream vacation for a person like, person like me, man. There's so much music history in those two cities. And then on March 30th, I'm going to see uh, Dylan in the Orpheum Theater. And right after that, Steely Dead is playing nearby in Memphis. And I've never seen these guys before, but I've seen the videos online. What a great combination. Steely Dan and the Grateful Dead. Uh, just, you know, puts a nice little twist. It's not just seeing another Dead cover band, but really something to look forward to. Man, I so love Steely Dan. So it's going to be uh, very cool. Dave A. Bear, who used to um, play in the Jerry Garcia band with, well, not the Jerry, but Melvin Seals with J and JGB for like six years. Um, I've seen him a bunch of times. He's the uh, lead guitarist of the, the Steely Dead. And hopefully we're going to get him on the podcast in a, in a week or two as well. Uh, so re really looking forward to seeing those guys for the first time. And whatever inspiration hits me when I'm down there in, in Tennessee, I'll come back uh, strong on April 1st in Beale Street with another episode of the Deadology Podcast. I'm your host, Howard Weiner. Thanks for listening. Peace out. Mm -hmm.